back to another episode of TNF, where this is not about food. I'm here with my one and only brother, Josh Greenfield. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? It's the kind of slip you want to take after a good day of filming. Oh uh, yeah, we just had a fantastic day of filming. We did some banh mi, we did some fried rice. We did the craziest potato and cheese pancake that I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. We don't have a name for it yet. Yeah, so we're actually, we're putting out a little contest. You win a free mandolin if you come up with the best name for this Mike's going to buy you a mandolin. You yeah. come up with this thing. Josh just, just kept offering Home my deliver services. one to your house, I think. <laughs> Wherever you are, he's going to come show up at your house in a tuxedo <laughs> with no pants. You are really screwing me here. But uh, yeah, that was a great, that was a great day. I'm excited to edit these videos and get them out for you guys. Yeah. Fantastic. It's but the, the real reason we're here today is because I actually way. haven't talked to my brother about this five day fast. And there's a reason because I know a lot of people mm -hmm. out there wanted to hear about this fast or very interested in how a man could not eat for five days or how a man is so dumb <laughs> he could go without food for an extended period of time like that. So I waited to talk to him until now so you guys can get the heads up as well. We've got a first caller. <laughs> Hello? H Hello? Yeah, hi, this is Aunt Jemima here. <laughs> Jemima? Uh, how you doing? Jem yeah, I was just wondering, how come a man who loves to eat goes so long without eating? Well, Jemima, that's a good question. I was thinking the same thing, Jemima. I mean, just come on, seriously, guys. How could you not eat? I mean, man, I'm eating right now, and I just had lunch five minutes ago. Well, Jemima, it's good. I mean, seriously, man, you go. All right, Jemima, we yeah, hang right, up thank on you, you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank. Well, we got the question, Jemima. Call back another time. Uh, I've done many fasts before. It's not my first fast. I've. You know, growing up being uh, in the Jewish faith, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> in the Jewish faith? Believing in the Jewish faith or just in, in it? Just in it. You uh, don't even have a choice at first. Yeah. Um, watch that. Yeah, no, I got it. Yeah. I got it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, sorry, Mike's just, he's, he's getting, his hands are getting a little too close to my inner right. thigh. <laughs> <laughs> Your inner microphone, uh, you could say, you uh, dick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you might want to watch yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I used to do the one day fast. Part of the Jewish religion, you had to fast for a day on uh, what was it? Uh, Yom Kippur. I Yom. Think. Uh, it was apples and honey for Rosh Hashanah. It's the day of sins. Day You're sucks repenting. for Yom Kippur. Um, so I remember we used to have to fast, and we would literally for a day. You couldn't drink water or eat at all. I mean, it sucked, of course. Like you could kind of slip in water. I when I was if you want to go it, to hell. Yeah, you're, you're right. Hello, Jews don't believe in hell, so we were pretty much. We were never really sure why we had to do these things. There was Jews no, don't believe in hell. There's only I the, think, I, I think the heaven Jews ground. Just heaven or heaven? Yeah. What are we having <laughs> that's, today? Heaven that's a good or, way. That's I think good it's faith like right pretty there. good heaven and really good heaven. All right, I like uh, that. So uh, don't quote me on that. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I think you're completely uh, full of shit. But we used to do these fasts, so you know it wasn't foreign to me. And um, years back, maybe like three or four years ago, I got really sick, and I went upstate, and I was. Uh, it was really cold, and I came back, and I was really sick, and I had just found this book. Um, like, I had these free books on my phone that I found, and one was about eating and health, and it was this old book guy I wrote in, like, the 20s. It was the most intense book I ever read about, like, eating and, like, masticating, like, chewing your food. Not and, masturbating. Will you, know, you explain masticating. what masticating is? <laughs> yeah, to chewing your food and, like, how you're supposed to chew your food, you know, 50 times, and, you know, make sure your, your feet... Uh, Make sure your teeth are breaking the food down. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a lot. I had a late show last night. I'm pretty tired. We got, got home late. Um, my band performed. Basically, mastication is the process of chewing food. And the idea behind it is that if you're chewing the food and breaking it down with your teeth, which are your, your first line of defense against uh, your food, then your stomach doesn't have to do as much work. So if you're one of those guys or girls that just sense. scarfs food down, then it's just sitting in your stomach, and your stomach has to break it down. Of course, you're gonna feel like shit. So why not chew it until it gets? I remember really fun. the first time I found out about the mastication process. I thought back to everyone I knew with stomach problems, 
and they always just basically like slurp their food down. Slurp. No chewing, like full pizzas just inhaled. Yeah. And even though and like then it's, it's just sitting in there and you're the acid in your yeah, good, good tea. We're drinking some oolong right now oolong. from the Chinese mountainside. Masturbating with oolong. <laughs> we're masticating with oolong. We got our next caller. I think oolong is coming in. <laughs> but yeah, I just I, I thought back to all the people that had serious stomach problems, and there could be someone listening right now. If you do suffer from stomach issues, think about if you're really chewing your food, if you're giving time to the art of masticating. And if you know, if you're given a good 20 bites every every session, you eat your tacos or something like that, it's gonna really help it out when it goes down yeah. there. And also it kind of shows, if you're eating shitty food, you're probably not gonna wanna be chewing it for too long because it's probably not very good. So the better food you're eating, the more likely you are to savor it, to eat it slow, to enjoy it. Uh, so it kind of works hand in hand. You, know, you slow down, you start eating better food, you won't need to eat as much, you'll feel better. You'll taste it more. You'll live longer. It's a win-win. It doesn't make sense to do it. I feel like way. when we, you know, when humans started cooking food, everything became so soft. So we really broke away from the art of chewing. Whereas you were eating raw meat back then, or just foraging for vegetables, you were just munching down yeah, munching. all of your food. Munching? And now we just eat McDonald's, and that thing just basically floats We sure as hell don't. So many people do. <laughs> Wasn't that the... Didn't someone say that all of fast food is just soft? Yes, yeah, it's, it's just soft. It just melts. It just melts right there. You don't even have to chew it. It just slips slips right yeah, down. It doesn't slip right out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does slip right out. Yeah, it's important to talk about slipping. Uh, if you hear us use the term slip, well, that just slipped out. We're talking about bowel movements, of course. Well, not of course, but for us, it's an obvious thing because... We find that talking about bowel movements really opens you up to the importance of being okay with it. I remember I used to uh, be in high school and, and the girl I was dating, I was so embarrassed to let her know that I was pooping. Because I would eat a lot of horrible food and I'd be on the toilet like, oh, okay. I used to have bad stomach problems. And I never wanted her to know that I was pooping. Never once discussed it in our three-year relationship. And now it's stuff I talk about all the time to everybody because... I think it's like, why be embarrassed? You know, everybody does it. One of our best friends, uh, John Clay, who we've talked about before, he grew up and he had an older sister and she gave him great advice once. She said, when you're in a relationship, you might as well just fart as loud as you can right off the bat. You get that thing out there because most people are super scared until they get used to the, you know, they get to know each other and then they let out maybe a little fart and they keep building and then they start talking about poop. But she just said, go for it. Because if you can fart and that girl still accepts you, then you know you cut out yeah. like months of possible bullshit. And I think that all girls secretly like they want to fart express as well. Fart. Yeah, you're caught. <laughs> there's, there's, this, there's this idea in America that like girls don't poop and fart. Like it's kind of this joke, but it's like guys, you know, because it's like not ladylike. There's this. I think guys don't like to imagine like their woman sitting on the crapper. You know, so there's, there's Wait, this... Wait, they poop? I thought they just, it breaks down and they yeah, breathe out gone. carbon di dioxide yeah, and it just releases out. No, they, <laughs> Believe it or not. So I think there's this concept. So I think it's, there's actually more pressure for the female. But females out there, I'm telling you, don't be afraid. At the end of the day, if you're in a relationship with someone and they don't accept you for who you are and your smells for what your smells are, you know, it's not worth it. They're, they're not obviously an open, good person. Holy shit, we're not even high yet, and we got so off topic. <laughs> no, there is no topic. <laughs> this is not about food. <laughs> so back to the fasting. You were reading your book, and it changed your life. Uh, yeah, it brings up, we got a next caller. Uh, hello? Hello? I think a, a Bruce Lee is on the line. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? <laughs> Bruce? Oh, Bruce, up. is that you? <laughs> Bruce, are you calling out from heaven? Is that the Jewish heaven or the, uh, the other heaven? <laughs> there was only heaven in your mind. <laughs> Do oh, not be afraid. There was time. only heaven in your mind. Bruce, that is a good call. You, do you have a question? or, or well, What is your question? I think you had a couple questions to us about fasting. Be like water, my friend. If you pour water into the cup, it becomes the cup. If you pour water into your mind, your mind becomes the water. Always be ever flowing like water. Thank you, Bruce. We appreciate that. And please keep calling in, but maybe next time you have a question for us, that would be great. Okay, so <laughs> back to fasting. Uh, you were asking what? I'm, so basically, you fasted for five days. I want to know a few things. 
I want to know why you decided to fast. I want to know how you felt through, how, how you evolved through those five days and how you feel after, what, how, how you changed. Well, I want to know if we asked, you asked me one question, I get off topic. How you think you can ask me three questions at once? Good point. All right. We'll start one with, question. well, you kind of already went over why you got into it. You read the book and you fasted when you were younger in uh, the old Yom Kippur. You want, oh, he's, he's on the tea now. Sorry, guys. We just I don't really stuff. drink caffeine, but I'm going for it today. A little tired. So explain to us the process of fasting. Damn it. Just burnt my tongue. Speaking of going yeah, too fast. Yeah, you got to let it cool off a little bit. Didn't let the tea cool off. Tongue is officially burned for the day. It's okay, tongue. Give you a little bit of Reiki he, healing. Yeah, he comes back um, in like a day. So sorry, first question. First question. How did you feel in the beginning of the fast and how did you change throughout? Well, because I've done a lot of fast, I am aware that it's very mental. Sure, there's the physical pain of hunger and all that stuff, but mostly you're psyching yourself out. Most people say, they're like, how could you fast? I can't go six hours without eating a meal. I want to punch someone in the face. So just having, you have to think about like, if you have that idea in your brain that you can't go a certain amount of time without eating, your brain's going to start screwing with you. Six hours in, you're going to start thinking, oh God, I'm going to die. I don't have energy. And when you believe that, that's what happens. So I know that first off, it's a very mental game. Day one is never a problem. It's like nothing happened. I'm thinking about food a lot. I'm definitely thinking, you forget that you can't eat. And you realize that food is like such a monumental thing throughout the day. It's like, I can't wait to get to lunch. I'm going to make this awesome thing. So do you think it's, it's good before you go into fast to maybe read a bunch of stories just to understand that it's possible to kind of break through like, oh wow, people have fasted for much longer than I'm fasting for now. So Yeah, I mean, I think listen, that helps. I, can. I, I think it helps, but it, you know, it's gonna be your own journey, you know, and some people are gonna quit right away and other people are gonna go for it. But I think it does help to know that there are people out there that have gone, you know, month plus without eating food. And it works for some people, it doesn't work for others, but you have to be open-minded about it. And, you know, the, the, the funny thing is you realize, like, if you're someone that's into food, if you're not into food, food can be an inconvenience. I know people that don't care about food. They just, like, eat because they know they have to. And it's, like, them. for them, it's like having to take time out of their day. But for the food, the millions and millions of billions of food lovers out there, it's like this monumental thing. You know, you're at work. I can imagine. I've never worked before, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and you're at work, you know, and you're, like, waiting. Okay, what am I going to eat for lunch, you know? And then... You order lunch, you make lunch, and then you're thinking, oh, what am I going to eat for dinner? Like, I want to try that new place. I want to make this new recipe. Like, it's kind of like this sort of reward that you give to yourself throughout the day, like having a little snack. Like, it's always, it's this, this like, ceremonial thing that you have with yourself. So not to have that, to have that taken away, day one, you're just thinking about it. You're like, oh, like, you're, you're bored. It's like, what do I do? I'll go eat some food. Like, I have a few minutes here. Like, what do I do? I'll go, you know, eat an apple or, you know, chips or whatever. Um, so yeah, I definitely thought about food all the time and then by day two you start to feel better you realize you can't eat and you just start doing other stuff and your brain you know you have more time to focus on other stuff I fasted in the past before where I actually the reason actually the first reason I really did it was because I realized I was devoting too much energy towards thinking about food so I wanted to say okay how can I like devote more energy towards music like if I cut food off then I'm almost forced in a way, even though I love playing music, I'm forced in a way to just focus on other things um, and allow my body also to focus on healing itself. And when, when you're constantly eating, your body's always like breaking down food and it's like you're digesting and this and that. But when you take it out for a few days, it allows itself just to kind of be clear and light. Um, and I've had fasts before where I've been super aware and super focused. I've had other ones where I'm more tired. This one was kind of a mix. Like I, day two was fine. Um, got a lot of work done. Day three and four, though, I was pretty tired. Actually, mm -hmm. like day three, I was, I felt weak. Like I could barely move much. I mean, I could get up, but like if I had to get up slower, I'd be kind of lightheaded. I, I couldn't really work that hard. I, I wasn't going outside. And when you look at that as part of the cleansing process, where your body is basically saying, you know, maybe I need two days to really cleanse itself and to reboot and that's going to take you know two days off the grind yeah i took i mean you take a break you know and, and we're both active people like i'm always working i'm always working on different projects you know we're editing we're filming videos i'm going to practice i'm writing books like whatever it is 
always working and sometimes it's nice just to like allow yourself to kind of cool down and reset so that way when you go back to doing everything you're able to approach it fresh because when you're it's like when you're studying you're trying to figure out like say some sort of weird math algorithm your brain can only handle so much and at one point it's going to start turning to mush and if you don't stop it's just going to keep getting mushier so if you allow yourself to take a break from it relax come back fresh and sometimes these things are really simple and i think i found it was interesting though because Day three was really tiring. Like I said, you know, I couldn't move too much. I was definitely weaker than normal. I wasn't tired. Like, I, my body was tired, but I wasn't mentally tired. That was the interesting part. Like, I, I wasn't, like, yawning throughout the day like I want to sleep. Like, I was completely awake. It's just that I felt, like, weak, I guess is the word. Um, another problem, though, was that it was freezing bitter cold yeah. out. Oh, wow. But I think, ideally, the best time to fast would be, like, in the fall or the spring. I fasted in the summer once and it was so hot I like I could only do two and a half, three days. It's actually uh, the exact opposite of what your body's probably trying to tell you because you know there's there's a thing called hibernation where it's like put on weight for the winter because you're not first of all, you need the fat to survive the cold and then you know you might not be getting food. So your mind is probably telling you get that food and you're doing the exact yeah, opposite. But it is the winter, so it should be the theoretically the hibernation point. if you prepared it. Yeah, prepared for it. <laughs> if you if you gathered your nuts and yeah. berries, yeah, nuts and berries. Uh, no, so when you know day three was tough, and then day four I woke up, and I was definitely like my body was weak. I wasn't really stretching. I wasn't doing much. I hadn't left the house in days. I was just I was like studying food a lot. I was actually watching a lot of food documentaries. I was creating these recipes in my head. I was cooking like. You know, I was cooking up ideas, but I hadn't really done that much cooking. I was just starting to do things that, like, I knew would take, you know, a couple days. Like, yeah. fermenting, making, like, I made this thing. I pickled pretty much everything. Like, raisins, Brussels sprouts, dates, kohlrabi, figs, cauliflower, pickle. Like, everything it, I could have put it in like pickle. to cook the food or prepare the food with knowing that you will not be able to taste Well, that was the interesting. I tried to make things that I knew couldn't really wouldn't finish for a couple of days. So by the time they were ready to be eaten, like I could eat them, even though yeah. theoretically there were things I could taste. But, but even I like if you're seasoning. making pickles, you don't, you don't really, I, it's I didn't hard to this. taste like a pickling brine when it's hot. And yeah. you know. But I had no just, idea. I mean, I, I do cook by taste normally. So like I would taste see if it's vinegary enough or salty. But the interesting part was I went to the market and that was the first time I walked in. There was actually a snowstorm the weekend I fasted. So it was good because I wasn't really doing much. Yeah. Um, and there was a snowstorm, so when I finally went out, uh, you should go out there. Um, when I finally went to the market, I was able to walk fine. I was, you know, I was going slow, but I walked fine. Everything was cool. When I got home and I started cooking, I felt it was crazy. Within minutes, something shifted in me, and I felt 100% fine. Like I felt like I wasn't fasting, I wasn't hungry, I wasn't tired, I wasn't weak. I just felt like, you know, I was my normal self. We're just going to step outside for a second. <laughs> just stick with us, luckily. Don't mind we, the sound effects. <laughs> we got the microphones attached to us, so we can go anywhere. Yeah, we anywhere can go for a walk want. if it wasn't 10 degrees. Keep going. So um, I started cooking, and I don't know if I was focused or just being able to do something, be creative. I felt totally normal. And the rest of the fast, from that point on, I felt completely normal and fine. That's, that's an interesting thing. So you basically, you hit a point around day four, you said? It was about three and a half, four days in. Yeah, the last day, <laughs> that last day was actually, <coughs> whoops. Thank you, guys. Now you just, <laughs> <laughs> I think you get the point. Shit. Basically, you know, the, the fast continued. At that point, though, like the last day, no matter how long a fast is, like if my fast is going to be, you know, a month long or a week or a day, like by the end of it, it, the hard part is that you're like ready to eat. You're like anticipating. You're like, oh my god, I'm gonna get to eat again. Yeah. I'm gonna get to taste food. I have been smelling so much. Like I was smelling apples, so fruit on day. Made all this stuff. Five. What was that like? Day five was just thinking like. You know, I just it was the excitement. Need food, and a little bit before my fast officially ended, I just squeezed some oranges, like fresh, and just had a little bit of orange juice because I learned the hard way last time that uh, if yeah. you eat too much food, 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you eat too much food, if you eat too much food out. after a fast, you will feel terrible. First off, I learned, and this might be the most important part, the roof of my mouth, the first time I did a four-day fast, was burning. I guess the roof of your mouth is really sensitive, and if food is not hitting it, um, you don't realize you take this for granted, but like it, it just kind of builds up a sensitivity. So when I started eating, it was burning. So this time around, I was always making sure to, to like kind of touch my tongue to the roof of my mouth, like yeah. brush up there. Um, it's funny because... I remember that happening and I was like, wow, like you were, it was, it just looked painful. Like it just looked really uncomfortable when it happened. And I was watching this thing on Vice about this guy who was surviving off this drink called Soylent for 30 days. And it's basically this nutrient packed, almost shake where you can get all your nutrients in with just a drink. And you, they say you can survive. It's some like techie new food. Oh, yeah. I don't believe it at all, but whatever. And he did it for 30 days. He got through it. He lost like 20 pounds. And of course, like the thing you, if say I'm taking you, I want, I want to break your fast or whatever. I will cook up the craziest thing for you. And that's what we did. We cooked up a four way pizza the first time. There's a picture it. online somewhere. I think. It was a one section it was a breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert pizza. One section was like chicken fingers. There was a Caesar salad. No, there were I'll, eggs. Give you, I'll give you the whole thing. I remember because this is my this is the meal I was so excited to eat. And we made this leading up to the fast. We made this pizza like homemade. And and uh, the first course was a bacon, egg, and cheese pizza slice that we each had one slice of each. Second it's was a bacon, chicken Caesar. Third was a homemade sausage pasta. Pizza and the final one was Jesus, churros with ice, <laughs> churros with ice cream. Wow! And I remember you ate it and you were just—it was very uncomfortable. I, didn't, but I took like a bite and I felt like I had a walnut for a stomach and I just ate an elephant. Like yeah, it was exactly. weird. So I'm watching this documentary and of course they take this guy after 30 days of only eating a shake. They take this guy to a chicken and waffles restaurant. And I'm looking at him before he, because he has no idea what he's getting into. He hasn't tasted real solid food in 30 days. And he's just scarfing down this chicken and waffles. Oh, yeah. And I, I know, I'm like, I've seen this go horribly wrong. They didn't show the ending, of course, because I'm sure he was in pain and they, they didn't want to show that. But yeah. I could just imagine 30 days eating chicken and waffles yeah. after drinking protein powder for, it's crazy. Wait, he did... This is the Soylent guy? This is the Soylent he guy. He ate chicken and waffles for 30 days after? No, he broke he his broke Soylent fast. Oh, okay. Fast. I thought you said then he did a 30-day chicken and waffle fast. <laughs> that actually, that, that, that's actually funny. Well, when Josh was fasting for three days, I was deep fry fasting. We, we decided to do a challenge. Hold on, we're transferring into... I know why it's so cold. We turned the heat off. Yeah, for... what's going on? We turned it off just for filming because it's so loud, but we're done. Oh, I was freezing my ass off in there. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, getting a little heat treat. We've accomplished something today. So Josh was, Josh was, sorry, I'll edit it out. Yeah. So when Josh was fasting for three days, we decided it'd be funny if I only ate deep fried food for three days. And that four, was, it was four challenge. days. Four days. It was four days. Oh, wow. That was my longest fast ever. And that was crazy because basically everything I wanted to eat, I had to figure out some way to put that thing in the deep mm. fryer. Basically, bread it with something or batter it with something. Yeah, it had and to put, be batter. But the cool thing was, on my side, it's any anytime you do a challenge, you always learn something fantastic. For me, I learned, I was like a three Michelin star rated deep fryer <laughs> by the end of that. And I was just like, I remember the creations I did, a deep fry oh, bacon, egg I and was... cheese, like rolled in the bagel. I had, I wanted cereal one day and somehow I figured out how to deep fry cereal, I think. I remember saying to stick, I think it was one of those things where like I had the idea to take like, I think here's how it was, it was a banana. It was hollowed out, and you made like a some sort of like milk jelly. I like think I jelly jellified the milk and put cereal in there, and then and then you put the banana together. So the hollowed out inside, you put the two sides together, 
Then you battered it with like cereal batter. No, or no. Something. First, I rolled it in a spring roll wrapper to like hold it oh. all in, and then I battered that and rolled it in like, like uh, cornflakes. Yeah, cornflakes. Yeah. And I, oh god, that was probably the best one. That's when Shots you're in dire need. I was, I was craving cereal, and you know what? You can make it happen. So it's like I learned how to deep fry. Josh learned how to, uh, I don't know. What do you... I learned how to not eat for four days. Exactly. And, you know, I, it, I'll give you another reason why I did it. Now, yes, there's like the health thing, so to speak. And, and I'll say that because that's what most people like mentally can relate to. But there is another idea that I always, uh, like probably the main reason I fast. Because I, I always think like I don't want to ever have to be dependent on any one like source to survive. Right? So... It's like, what if something happened and I couldn't eat food for X amount? Like, what if all of a sudden, usually we get hit by an asteroid and all of a sudden, like, you know, food is just gone. It's wiped out. And this used to, like, just, it wouldn't, like, freak me out, but I just wondered what would happen. So I started fasting, and when I was fasting, the first time I did the four-day fast, I had this dream. And I was on a boat, and I was out in the middle of the ocean. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, in an instant, all the water just evaporated, gone. And like the boat plopped down into the sand. Now we were like pretty much in the desert, which was just the dried up ocean. And there was no water, nothing. And in that moment, I knew two things. I knew one, that food and water like was just completely gone forever. I just had this feeling. I was like, I just know it's in the dream. It was just done. And two, I was totally cool about it. Like I didn't freak out. And everyone was freaking out. And I was like, well, like I haven't eaten in a while, you know. So I think it's that idea to almost kind of have the one up that if something ever did happen, like, I know that I could at least last a long time, yeah, like, mentally. Like, you know, maybe, like, 30 days. And the thing is, maybe you're going to be so far ahead of, like, the people who are just suffering for, like, those... Um, people that can't make it six hours. Exactly. It's going to be chaos. And just freaking out and who can't think, like, all right, what should I do now that the world is, like, crumbling? Yeah. It's like, do you think about food or do you think about, like getting the hell away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and not that I'm saying I hope this has happened or I think it's going to happen or anything, but I just know that if it's anything just a dream, did happen, just, yeah, if, if anything did happen, though, just a dream set. of Josh's. And also, you know, there, there's the other point of, there are case studies done on people that just claim that they never eat. And not a lot of people know about this, but there's like a lot of documented cases about these stories where people like, oh, like I haven't eaten in 30 years. You know, and it just it like baffles <laughs> science completely. And scientists have even gone to people's houses and they've studied. They'll like stay there for a month or so. And they'll study this person and they'll completely watch them. And they won't eat for a month. They'll show them like going to the bathroom, you know, like and it would be like barely anything. And they, they write about it and like we spent an entire month with them, like never eyes off. And this person didn't eat once, you know, and they were, they were, they were fine. And they're claiming they've gone their whole life. So it's like. You know, when you think about miracles or whatever you want to call it, but things that science doesn't understand, like most scientists don't really understand much. So when you fast, a lot of people have their opinion about how it's going to go. They're like, oh, is I it like going to be... I like that line. Most scientists don't generally understand much. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty generalized right there. I'm sure some of them understand a lot. I mean, they, but they don't um, know. Do they understand everything no that's under, ever? You can't understand because whatever you're trying to understand is going to evolve, and then you're trying to understand the next thing. There's no, it's either like you understand 100 percent or you don't understand it at all. That's, that's a good point. You know? So if you're saying if you don't have full total understanding of everything, then you don't understand. You don't understand, <laughs> yeah. And with science, so it's, no a, it's a never ending. Yeah. <laughs> so so food, for example, like you can, you can go to, you know, you can. You can go to the market and you can eat a certain type of food and then you can go to a doctor and they can do tests on you and say, well, here are your charts. Like, you're, you know, you're this level is 100 and you're that level is you know, minus 20 over 75 and et cetera, et cetera. And, like, I think you need to eat more of this and eat more of that and this and that. And they can, like, tell you things based on what they've seen. But at the end of the day, it's just, like, it's still just an idea. You know, someone gives you a percentage about something, like you have this chance of getting better or whatever it is. Like, if you have... If you believe that you have a 70% chance or a 30% chance, that's going to affect like how you see it. Whereas like some people just 100% are going to heal. And if you're putting yourself with this like number, and I think scientists are, like they're good at doing that. They're good at putting people in boxes. It's it's pretty true. Like what the hell is a percentage chance doing for your? What is it doing for you? <laughs> what is it doing? Like shouldn't they just say you have a 100% chance of getting better and like? 
all right, if, you know, maybe you don't get better, but at least, like, you'll believe or be... Well, then they'd be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. That's, I think if, if a scientist, like, were to think that way, they'd have nothing to be sciencing. Yeah, so. <laughs> Another good point about the fast is um, not only mentally do you sort of have to overcome food, but what happens to your brain when you stop eating food because most people don't realize because food you have to do it your brain is always telling you to eat to survive of course so when you take that away from your brain a few things can happen one is that your brain doesn't have to focus on eating food digesting food which mm -hmm. is such a hard process for your not hard it's natural but your brain that's a big part of it it might so well, maybe when you eat fried energy. rice 50% of you know your brain power for the next hour is going to figuring out how to digest mm. that fried rice. Yeah. So you take that away and you got 100% of your brain power 100%. back. 100%. So what is that like? That's the problem with food is that it lingers in the body. Like your mind and your body, you know, people say mind over body, they're, they're the same. Like they're both there. Like you can say, "Oh, I feel something in my stomach." It's still my brain thinking about it. Like, no, it's your brain is your stomach, your stomach is your brain. It's all like, it's all about the whole picture here. So I think when like, when you eat a meal and you know, you start to feel a little slow and a little sluggish, maybe a little like confused because you ate like this really big meal and then your stomach starts to hurt and then you're thinking about that and you're trying to have a conversation without like leaking farts out your butt and like, you're like, do I go to the bathroom? Do I like stop talking to this person I'm talking to? You know, I'm at a bar and like I'm having a good time. And it starts putting all this like stuff in your mind. Whereas if you just eat something like and you're aware of it and it's clean, uh, and you take it in and then you're done the meal, if you can like not. But think that's about like food. that's phase one. I'm just saying for that phase where even if I eat a raw carrot, my brain has to send billions of signals to my stomach and say, How are you gonna digest that carrot? So when you Obviously, when you eat bad stuff, it's worse because your brain yeah. has to, it's, it's harder to figure out the bad no, stuff. But course, when you well, cut food out completely, I mean, I guess it's got to also figure out like, whoa, you know, my body has Well, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's no the amount of space. It. Like, I can't really say like billions of signals and stuff because I don't, that's not something that I actually know about what's happening. But what I do know is like what my mind, like what I'm thinking about and how it's affecting me. So even like a carrot, for example, whatever thoughts come with that, it's like that addiction. So when, yeah, when you're not eating, like you're still having thoughts, food is still consuming. It's interesting because you can't fast from thinking about food. And that's the trick. That's what screwed with me this time because I still, I'm so into like food and I realize that's how much point. I love it and think about it. Like even when I'm not eating in my brain, I'm just like coming up with recipes. I'm tasting food in my head and it's just like, that's and, a good point. and that's the, like, how do you, how that's, do you get away That's from that? the that, double fast. That's what they don't tell you that's about. That's the hardest fast. That's, yeah, that's the, uh, yeah. And, but it was, I mean, that's like, that's like meditating in general. It's like you have to get away from, I mean, your brain is, is always hungry for thoughts. It's, it's always, always hungry, freaking you know? out, you know, it, it's not just food. Yeah. It's like, how do you get away from that? Well, I don't remember the, the statistic was, but someone was saying that, the average person's like dreams are really bland and mundane and like boring, like just going to work, you know, not really doing much. It's very basic. Where like every night, like I feel like I'm fighting to save the universe or something crazy in my sleep is always happening. It's like the best movie I could never have imagined. And things are exploding, things are like, come, people are coming to attack me. I'm like running, you know, I'm freeing, I'm saving, like I'm doing all this crazy shit. Uh, and that is where things really start to get intense on the fast because everything becomes very lucid. Like there's this, there's this coloring, this stuff. Like you'll be sitting there not eating or watching someone eat. And like, I don't, I don't shelter myself. Like I'll stay around food, I'll watch food and I'll do this stuff. That and, is the weird part. But the colors of everything get really like When vivid. you start like watching people eat and you're like, holy shit, like I, I do that. Like I just like shove food down my face yeah. all the time. Shove, and not only shove food, but when you approach food again and you take, like I remember when I drank the orange juice, I squeezed it fresh and I put a little bit, like I put half of a lime and I juiced three whole oranges and that was it. 
and I took one sip, and it like punched me oh in my God, the face. Oh my God, I can't even imagine. And even just that sip was such an experience. So to think about like the way we take food and we just kind of take it down, and we're taking it, it's like almost taking in like Muhammad Ali, you know, Mike Tyson like left and right combos <laughs> to the face every like two seconds and trying to shove that like into this quick instant approach. Because flavor is so... And it's your powerful. brain trying to fight off like a fucking Tyson roundabout, like, oh, what am I doing? It's just combinations of cheeseburger and oh chicken my God. wings. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Cheeseburger, chicken wing, left and right hook, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it is a lot. It is. That cheeseburger offered a hard right. Oh, that cheeseburger will, <laughs> will fuck you up. But when I, so when I was breaking the fast, like I had the orange juice and then right after that I had one raspberry and I actually, it was like it was a blackberry and I didn't like it. It was so, it tasted so bitter. And since then, like I've been eating for the past week, like I'll have a couple every day. Maybe it was on the I mean, bitter it, side. It's, so I ate another one and it was still really bitter. And then right after, I've ended up eating the entire like thing, unless those two happen to be just like the most scary bitter I've ever tasted fruit before. The other ones tasted a lot more sweeter. So like you, you, you're getting hit with these senses that you don't realize you're maybe muting because you're taking in so much food. Yeah. You know, and you're appreciating you adapt like, like very so small quickly. Things. That's what's crazy about your mind and your body is like in like two days you adapt, your tongue is just like so oh, sensitive God. to things because you're not just completely bombarding it. I, I think you were saying um, like you were eating with Sasha and she had just done like a raw diet. Yeah, just for like... Three or four days, she did a raw cleanse, just raw food, and it's not even you know that bad. A lot of vegetables and um, you know juices and things like that. But when she the first time she had food, it was at a Japanese restaurant, and you know when you go out to eight you know Asian restaurant, Chinese, Japanese, it's salty. It's like umami is just the you know that sense that they nail. Mm -hmm. But oh. when she was tasting the food, like it just hit her so much harder. She was like, this is so salty. And I'm like, yeah, it's Japanese. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> salty, but it was like almost too much to handle. Yeah, for her. And you I don't mean, even realize, you know. It happens. You know, I, I mean, and that is, that's always the part that I know I appreciate. And I can't deny like most of my fast, there is an element of backfire. Because what happens is you get so excited to eat that like you will have a tendency like you want to eat everything because you're like oh my god there's so many foods if like the only food we knew was like one dish then you just want to eat that but because they're like 600 dishes that you oh, crave yeah. yourself from you're like oh I want to try a little bit of that so I was making like I was taking these little tiny teacups that hold you know a quarter cup of water in them and I was making like these miniature meals like miniature soup and I was like I'm just gonna eat these tiny little meals <laughs> and you take like a really small spoon. And you just like slowly take little things with this broth and it's like such an intense oh, wow. experience. You don't need a huge bowl to get it and slurp it down. You're like one bite and close your eyes and you taste the food. And the tasting of that experience is so amazing. And you realize that when you are scarfing food down, you never get that. Because it's like this never ending, like you're grazing yourself with the food. You're never allowing one taste to really sink in. You're just trying to like shovel it all down your throat. And that's kind of like a bigger metaphor in food in general and how it mentally affects people in an age like this because we have access to any food we want, like the sweetest food and the saltiest food mm -hmm. and like the most well-prepared food. We live in New York City. It's so, it can be so overwhelming for people when they come here and there's like, not only like all oh, the five coolest, best restaurants in the world, it's like yeah. you have every restaurant going down here how do you mentally overcome like not needing all that because of course when you try to eat all that that's rough for you because you're not like you know we we should be just eating you know what's around and well i can tell you i've never a had a balanced diet where we're all over the world and it's crazy no it's true i mean i've had some good you know restaurant meals but we eat out very very little maybe i know for me personally like 1% of my food is like eaten. I don't like prepare by hand. Oh, you know? now you're all a uh, scientist on it's, me yeah. with these percentages. That's, and a, that. that's, that's, a, that, that's a very good percentage. <laughs> that's based off nothing. That's based off just a no, guess. But Pretty much what I'm trying to say is maybe, I eat out very, maybe very once, rare. Would you say um, one to three times a week? Like uh, think about 
like in like everything. This could be a quick like bite for lunch. I mean, now no. That's a crazy. I mean, I'm it, trying it, to think too. Yeah, like, I, I don't mean, think... we were on vacation and we were still cooking. We would maybe go out to lunch here and there. I guess the point I'm making though is that when you start to get into your food, actually, um, a friend of mine, he is a luthier. Which, if you don't know what a luthier is, they are basically people that make guitars. Um, I didn't know the name myself, and I had already built a guitar. I didn't even know the word <laughs> existed. And so, Wait, he what is to, it? It's a luthier. So you're a luthier. I mean. It's like cooking no, one no, great no. meal it's and like, saying you're a uh, chef. Yeah. You know, it's like you know. could be. Yeah, exactly. It's up to you. <laughs> you're a luthier. You know? But there's like you know, there's schools for it. And um, I have a friend who's he owns this in Troy, um, New York, upstate. He owns this really cool guitar shop called College City Guitar, and he's been sending me pictures. He's like, like he'll send me a picture of like the pepperoni like flatbread pizza that we do. Um, he's like, yeah, hey, this cooking thing's not that bad. Like you can tell he's like just starting to get into it. Same with like Derek. Like he, you know he eager to send you pictures because like you know he's watching your videos and you're teaching how to cook but so my friend um, Peter he's been sending me these pictures of like cooking and, and talking about how much he's been like enjoying me he's like this thing's great like I'm excited to get more into this like you know, you know I love watching the videos and it really like you have that first experience where you make your own food and it's like awesome even if it's not that great it's just like if you have the good experience like if you can find a way to enjoy that experience. So this is what with our videos what we're trying to do. We're not just trying to say like, here's a recipe. We're making it like we want. The reason we act the way we do and we are the way we are on camera is because we just like to have fun. You know, it's not about it being right. And if we want to try to make something look good or like that, you know, that's fine. But it's really just like in the moment. Like today we were um, making these chicken meatballs. And I've been making chicken meatballs for a while. And at first I, I bought the meat already ground up. And then I started trying to think of ways where I could grind the meat up. So I threw it in the food processor. We ground the meat up and that was pretty good. But I was like, you know, not a lot of people have food processors. So what becomes the next step? I was like, okay, well maybe I could pound it. So I, I had yesterday, I had a meat pounder. And I took Ziploc bags and I put the meat in there and I start like, I had already cut it up in pieces and I'm pounding it. Like trying to pound, like pulverize this thing so it is like literally just like falls apart. And it, meat juice is like flying everywhere. And it just, it didn't work. Like I, I was able to form a meatball and it was actually interesting. I think we shouldn't forget this because it is a cool idea, especially if you were to use an egg. Basically you make a meatball almost out of like little pieces of chicken. Right, so like you're able, to, I was able to form it, and you fry it, and it's a pretty cool looking yeah, thing. Yeah, it looks like a delicious meatball. too. Yeah, and it was good. I mean, you had nice. So that was another great thing I would like to try. But last night I was in the shower, and you know, I got back from my show, and I was like, there has to be a way for me to be able to like make minced meat. Just like so you guys meat. know, this guy never turns it off. It's. He, he said he stayed up late because he had a tiring show. No, he comes back, he gets in that shower, and he figures out how to grind that meat with a household standard appliance. Oh my God. So, this light bulb goes off, and it may have come from the fact that if you buy mozzarella cheese, and you're having trouble, you're trying to shred it, and it's too soft, put it in the freezer for a little bit and then shred it when it's like a little bit frozen, it's a lot easier. It may have come from that idea. So I get out of the shower, I'm in my towel, I run over, I throw the chicken in the freezer and I'm like, what if I shred frozen chicken on like a cheese shredder? And I, so when we went to filming today, I had no idea if it was gonna work. Like I figured something would happen, but I didn't know if it was gonna be, get like defrosted too quickly but we tried it and it actually worked great. It took a little bit of effort, there's no question about it. I think if anything, you would have taken it out of the freezer, just like cheese sometimes. You take it out of the freezer an hour before and let it thaw a little, or I don't know, yeah, 20 yeah, minutes like or something. Yeah, let it thaw just a little bit. And then, because it was like a rock when it came out, so it definitely got easier when we... Well, my, your hand starts to freeze. Yeah. And it's, it's cold already, so... But it's actually kind of a cool trick if it was it was like a hotter day and you like had frozen chicken and you wanted to eat it real quick. I mean, when you think about it, it's the only way to like defrost something extremely quick that's not, you know, throwing it in the microwave. Shred it up. Yeah, you shred it up and it, it, it defrosts and we formed it's it in true. meatballs and made this banh mi that was incredible. Oh yeah, it's a good banh mi. So, uh, you know, when, it, when I was fasting, one of the big things that I did that I was able to focus on a lot was I started writing a new book called um, W-I-T, which is what is food. Oh, sorry, W-I-F, 
With. Because right. <laughs> I think there's a show called WTF. What? Yeah. So WIF, what is food? With and um, basically the concept is what is food beyond like what most books are talking like like when most of the books that are coming out right now people are talking about on a scientific approach how it affects your body or they're talking about an agricultural like or societal but for me like what about like this sort of psychological element of food that's there in your life that a lot of people aren't talking about like just specifically because it is such an addiction you know and it's no different than like being addicted to drugs for some people because it rules their life it's probably going to kill them if they continue to have the same habits and there are a lot of uh, I mean a lot of people that I know and me included that have these like weird you have these really weird addictions to food and you like don't know how to break them you know and that's why that at the end of the day that's another reason why I really do the fasting is because like I start to get too into something so I kind of like just take it away for a few days to see what it really is to reapproach it and now when I reapproach food it's like a little bit more fresh I'm like okay I'm gonna be a little bit more mindful I'm gonna slow down eating I'm gonna appreciate the ingredients more you know I was starting to even like cook a lot of meals very simply just cut stuff up, throw it in, heat it up, you know, not really think about it. Uh, so it's nice to reapproach it and be like, okay, what does each element like mean? What is every flavor? And I can taste flavor, I think, a little more intense now. Oh, yeah, you know? I bet. That's why I love the seasons, because you take a break mm -hmm. every single season and you come back to it, and it's just the circle of appreciation every single time. Oh, yeah. It really is. Uh, it's nice. I mean, it's nice to have that here. Yeah. But I mean, that, that's crazy. You know, uh, a five day fast. What would you what would you recommend to people who might want to start fasting at a I don't know, at, for their first time or they don't start with do a day. The full five. Do it, by all means, do it. Start with a day. You know, this whole life thing is all about getting to know yourself like more and more intimately every day. And your body plays just as big a role in anything. So like it's important to know how your body works, like what it can eat and feel good, um, you know, to what level it can eat. And again, you can sit there, if, if you're someone that wants to go to the doctor and have them tell you, then that's fine. Go, like by all means, go to a doctor, let them tell you what they think you should eat or a nutritionist or whatever it might be. Which by the way, doctors don't even really like, I think the weird thing is doctors don't know much about nutrition. Most doctors don't ever learn about it. So they're, instead of telling someone how to eat better, they prescribe them a pill. And that's just like, that's just how they know. Because that's what they do now. That's what they do. And that's what they know. And to them, that's that. But then they have these nutritionists and these um, like wholeness centers and different people that are healing people just like through telling them to eat better, you know, or telling them to change their habits. And then they change their lifestyle. It's like they don't need any pills or things that they're, they're told, like, you know, having some disease is never going to go away. And then something is cured you know, that was supposed to be uncurable just because you change your eating habits. Like, yes, something is uncurable, like, in your current state of mind. Like, if that's who you're going to be, like, then this thing's always going to be there. But if you do make big changes, um, it can just not be, not exist anymore. And I think that's what really makes it hard for me to have any kind of, like, true faith or trust in, in science and, like, the medical community in that way because it, it's not that one person is like right or wrong so like everybody doesn't really know what's going on but they have to follow certain procedures you know and it's like this has been happening for a long time and that's just kind of the way it is and it works for people that like just believe in that then they believe in that and that's life for them but it doesn't have to be and that's kind of the point that I'm trying to get at is like it doesn't have to be about just assuming things are the way they are because someone told you like you can you can fast for once. Someone might tell you fasting is horrible and a lot of people are like that sounds like a horrible idea um, and, and they can back it up with whatever kind of information they want. But I can just see like you post the thing on you know social media fasting for five days and just like 80% of the people are like what an idiot why would he ever do that? Yeah like that's crazy because you start thinking about yourself you're like I can never do that or like I saw this thing once or someone told me it's bad but it's always that it's like always like it always comes back to that same thing it's like you don't really know you know, it's like, it's like they, reviews for movies. Never listen yeah, like to some the random, reviews. Some random guy is telling me what he thinks of a movie and I'm supposed to listen to his review and be like, 
oh god, this guy didn't like it. Like I don't know what was going on that day. I don't know anything about this person. Like, was like he, how do you go into a movie up? already like knowing that you know? Yeah. Already having your mind made up. And that's and you know and I I get like a lot of people it's like of course I want to read reviews so I don't waste my time and this and that but like. There's so much information. There's always going to be someone. There's not a movie out there, that, even if it's just the guy that made the movie. Like, there's always someone out there that likes it, you know. And there's a chance you could too. It could get a twenty-five percent on Rotten Tomatoes, but there might be like this one hilarious yeah. scene, or some of like the worst movies in the world become those cult classics because they're so bad that they're so bad, hilarious. Yeah. And then it's your favorite movie all of a sudden. You probably watch that movie more times than you'll watch like. You know, Academy Award yeah. <laughs> nominated movies. Well, you, I mean, you also, it's it just like with food, like you don't really know, you know? So why be so afraid to, to like take a chance if you want to take a chance? And that's what I did with fasting. And I tried it. It's like, yeah, sure, anything can happen. But like, I felt good. I felt really positive. And, and I started with a day. And the first time I did it, I did it for one day. And I was like, that wasn't bad. Okay, then I tried uh, two days. And then, no, so then I tried, I did one day, maybe twice, and then I did a two and a half day fast, and then I did four days. And this is all in the course of like, you know, a few months, and I was tr kind of training up to it. And maybe that's what made this fast actually a little bit harder, is it's been a couple of years since I did a fast. So to jump right to five days was like, you know, I wasn't, I mean, I was, I was pretty sure in the training. Yeah, I didn't even like kind of wean myself off of it. Um, but I think it's a good way to start slow. You know, it's just like cooking, like don't expect to, be a master chef or whatever right away. Just try to make something. You know, try to play a note on a guitar. You know, try to write a poem and like build and build and build from without there. you know without any prior reviews or thoughts about what could happen. Yeah. You know, try to go into it with an open mind and start very small. Know that you don't have to dominate the world in one day. You, you don't know, have this to. is this is life. You got to go through the ups and downs to push on. Oh, yeah. True. Not so ups and downs. <laughs> but um, I think that's a good session for us. Yeah, we'll wrap it up. Thank you guys for listening, and we're excited. We got a bunch of really cool videos coming out soon. So follow Brothers Green Eats. Uh, you know, we put out a video every one you live in the desert, you live week in the at least. <laughs> we're getting down to it at least. We're I don't know why my voice went that low. But um, Thank yeah. you guys. And,